try to use her own thing to, to explain uh, some generic uh, figures. For example, if you're showing data, you can say, you know, uh, so and so has shown that this work, these data, and then you can explain what the data is actually telling you. I, I think that's a better way to go. And then, of course, you should, of course, as always, reference the original reference uh, on, on those kind of things. So hopefully this way, uh, you are focusing on learning the concept rather than uh, making all this illustration uh, and so forth. Of course, you're welcome to do that if you find that interesting, but you don't have to. You can, you can copy, uh, you can indeed copy illustration figures and, and uh, scheme and things like that on there. Okay? Uh, and if you're using the equation, uh, then of course you would uh, need to reference the where it's coming from doing derivation and things like that. You should reference uh, uh, the derivation, unless you are the one who actually do the derivation. So uh, we do those derivations all the time. But, but that's rare cases. Uh, and you may not have time to do all that. So, so I, I think the goal of this is for people to uh, uh, do a little bit of research. Uh, the literature is part of the skill uh, when you go into graduate school or later on in life to do a little bit library research and then uh, and then give something uh, uh, intelligently written report uh, in an organized uh, fashion in an in a, in a organized fashion so they are marked in, in the look and organization how pretty the report is that's important I think because people see the organization of the report first before they actually read the content so it is important to take a look at this. Okay, so uh, is there any uh, 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 is there any question on this? Uh, about this? If, if there is a question, you can always uh, send me a message. Okay, so so again, the term, so I suggest people uh, start working on this because uh, you have a few weeks before the, I know this is a busy time for a lot of people for, because of the midterm. You may have a couple of weeks just before the end of the term to work on it, but it's good to get a little bit organized when you know the deadline. Okay, so uh, there will be, I have put up uh, a second uh, second uh, problem set on the web as well, so you could uh, download that. I have not mapped your first uh, problem set one. I will do that this weekend, so I will return this to you. Um, and there will be, after assignment number two, there will be one more assignment, okay? And then we have term paper and, and the final Okay. All right, so we are, we are slightly uh, behind in our schedule a little bit, so I'd like to uh, try to keep to the uh, schedule this, this, this lecture. So let me uh, go back a little bit, and, and we were trying to look at... Uh, Service structure determination, we have talked about lead before we, we break, and we spent a fair amount of time last last lecture talking about uh, XF, okay, extended X-ray absorption fine structure. And before I was talking about this, I was talking about the photoelectron uh, photoemission, X-ray photoemission. So this is uh, a reminder of what we have done uh, about uh, XPS of photoelectron spectroscopy, uh, because this this is go right into later on when we talk about the electronic structure determination as well. So I like to uh, we spend a little bit of time uh, uh, trying to make sure people uh, follow uh, these uh, these uh, the, the, the principle of photoemission, uh, which is a primary tool in in electronic and and chemical uh, composition. Determination of, of material, including including nanomaterial. So we we mentioned in something called the ESCER or the electron spectroscopy or, or chemical analysis, um, the Kaiser Bond, uh, who got Nobel Prize for coming up with this technique, uh, was uh, noticing the uh, chemical shift, so-called chemical shift, depending on the local environment of the of the uh, electron of the photoelectron, uh, the, 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 the 
see where the fluid exon is coming from. So when you're looking at carbon one S uh, electron coming from these carbons, right? Uh, the immediate local environment will uh, affect the actual uh, location, the so-called binding energy or ionization energy of that particular uh, fluid electron. Okay, so so here's an example that we mentioned last day about uh, such an effect, so-called chemical uh, chemical effect, chemical uh, shift uh, effect that uh, it is uh, relevant to local bonding. So for example, this one, uh, you can compare cis dichloroethylene, trans dichloroethylene, and iso dichloroethylene. The different atom, as indicated by different color, give you different uh, location of the carbon one as the peak, and, and, the, and the ratio between these, these peaks uh, is important because the ratio of these peaks correspond to the stoichiometric ratio of the number of carbon atoms that you have, respectively. So you have one to one ratio here because you have one carbon atom with this red environment and the uh, uh, one uh, carbon atom with the green environment, you see. So the, so the peak intensity should be close to one to one. So there's a lot of power in recognizing that even though you are taking an electron out from the deep core, core uh, electron, core shell, Electron, removing it from the core energy level, uh, that core energy level is still sensitive to the local uh, environment that you have. So that's a powerful recognition, and in fact, it's been used quite extensively now in terms of analyzing uh, using this such a chemical shift technique to analyze uh, the material that you have. And because photo emission, uh, as we'll see later, is service sensitive. Uh, it, it is very powerful to looking at liner material because uh, at small amount of material near the surface, what kind of state that you find. Uh, and and uh, we uh, mentioned last day as well about these uh, uh, emissions. So we have the ground, uh, the electronic states here, which indicates the M, which is the neutral state. You ionize. Uh, this uh, neutral state, neutral uh, uh, molecules, if you like, uh, and let's say you remove one electron from the one S electron here, this electron come out, and I mentioned last day that you could uh, be, ex you could go back. This become an excited state, right? After you create core hole in the in the deep core energy level, uh, then this is an unstable, uh, unstable state or excited. This excited state will try to decay uh, into a more stable state. Okay, so the way you can do that is to, for the upper electron to fill this core hole, so-called core hole. And if you do that, you would get some sort of radiation uh, decay or fluorescent, fluorescent decay. So this is what uh, X-ray fluorescence is all about. There are techniques uh, out there. There are machines, uh, commercial machines that you can buy. And and, uh, and the geologists are very interested in X-ray fluorescence, and especially mining industry are very interested uh, in this sort of uh, technique is that they shine an X-ray onto the material and look for the X-rays that come out. And this X-ray signature for this this X-ray signature, you can see it depends on the energy level difference of the material. So so that gives you the chemical signature because each uh, each uh, element will have a different uh, energy level, and the difference in the energy level will give you different uh, X-ray emission uh, with different uh, frequency or, or uh, energy. Okay? So this X-ray fluorescence uh, is a elemental analysis technique that allows you to detect, uh, identify the element where the X-ray photon is coming from, because they have its own uh, signature. Uh, we have talked a little bit about this also. Uh, if you excite the electron, uh, if you create, a, 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 this is called a, a absorb a photon in a photo electron spectroscopy or for emission. You absorb the photon completely. Okay, so this is known as a resonance process. The, the entity absorbs the complete photon. Uh, and then uh, it undergoes this, this excitation. Now, of course, you don't necessarily need to. Um, need to do it that way. You don't need to 
send in a photon, you can send in a high energy electron beam and excite uh, your, uh, your um, uh, material, in this case your, your molecule, um, in, in a similar way. This is called a, a non-resonant process because now you have 